Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, we will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book, A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit the Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. If you feel inspired to make a love offering, please visit us at miraclevoices.org forward slash donate. All donations go to support the work of the Foundation for Inner Peace, the publisher of A Course in Miracles. Now here's your program. Welcome to another edition of Miracle Voices. This is Matthew McCabe, your co-host, and I'm here with my co-host, Tam Morgan. Tam, how are you doing today? Really well, thank you. I'm very excited for this particular podcast. Yes. Yes, we have sisters today, and their names are Johanna and Lisette. Johanna von Zwet and Lisette von Donkersgut. Did I get that correct? Ooh. That yeah. was good. wonderful. Wow. Wow. Okay. wow. <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Impressive. Very impressive. Okay. I'm not well, going to say that. I'm just going to say Johanna and Lizette. That's right. Well, Lizette, why don't you kick this off and tell us where, where are you sitting right now? Where are you in the world? Well, Matt, I'm uh, and Tam, I'm uh, in the Netherlands, in Europe, and in the south of the Netherlands, in the province of Zeeland. Okay. That's where I live. And how about you, Joanna? Um, currently, I'm in Switzerland, but I move about a bit. So sometimes I'm in Belgium and sometimes I'm in Poland, but currently I'm in, in Switzerland, enjoying it very much. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, welcome to you both. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. And this is rare for us. It's a stretch for Matt to have two people. Well, really, four people, including us. So it's yeah, so so, so many variables. Okay, so well, let's let's go ahead and get started. So, Joanna, please tell us how did a course in miracles come into your life? The course of miracles came into my life actually through two um, avenues. The first avenue was the Edgar Casey readings and the community around the Edgar Casey readings, um, the ARE, and um, about. 35 years ago or so, I became a member of the ARE because I was so impressed with the Edgar Casey readings. And um, in the ARE publication called Venture Inward, the Course in Miracles was sometimes mentioned. So it was like a, a word or, or a, a title that was familiar, had become familiar to me over the years. And then uh, at the time, Marion Williamson published her book, A, Re- a Return to Love, um, I didn't know about it. And a friend um, was raving about the book. She said, I've read a book. You should read it. And so we talked about it. And it appeared that it was on the basis of A Course in Miracles. And so I bought the book right away. And um, after that, I bought A Course in Miracles. And I've been hooked ever since. And so that's a little over 30 years ago. Mm. Sorry about that. I was muted. 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, Edgar Casey seems to be a big on ramp for a lot of people, me included. Um, I'm trying to remember the book about him. There is a river, I think right. it's called. That's a right. really good one, really good one. But what an interesting character he was. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what it was that fascinated you so much about Edgar Casey. What fascinated me most about Edgar Casey it was his sincerity. Mm. Through everything that I read in those early days, the sincerity just touched the chord in with me, and um, and w- he he had a, a lot of readings, like over fourteen thousand readings, and some of the readings were about um, spiritual matters, you know, people's lives, life's mission and path, and those were the ones that interested me most. I know there's many people who are interested in the Edgar Casey readings because of the physical readings, um, all kinds of uh, holistic cures to all kinds of illnesses. And um, that's all good and well, but that wasn't really my focus. My focus was on the Search for God um, readings and the the two Search for God books with the 24 lessons in them. And I've been doing those lessons ever since, to this day. Mm. That's I love that that with The Course in Miracles, you can partner with anything else you're doing as well. It's not exclusive. So I like hearing that. Um, Yeah, and especially the Casey, you know, the Search for God readings, there's 
only occasionally that I will think, hmm, this is a slightly different take <laughs> compared to the course. But, um, you know, it's I can live with those differences. They're, they're both so, so um, sincere and, and right to the heart. Yeah. And, and that's uh, what I Johanna, I, I don't think I ever told you this, but um, it, my mother started to read all about Edgar Casey, and she shared with me the, her readings, and she started talking about auras and all sorts of um, that you know he could see auras, and I was fascinated. And then one day, I think I was in about fifth or sixth grade, fifth grade, she um, she asked me to send a telepathic message to my grandmother because we really needed her to come home. There was uh, an emergency, and so I I did I. And my grandmother called right away when no one could reach her. And then my mother came in to me after and said, you know, what did you do? How did you send that message? And I I told her my process. I sat and I looked into the mirror and until I, I became invisible. And as I started to become invisible, you know, I all these colors would come around my head and then I'd move into being invisible. And she said, you mean auras? And I said, no, 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 just those colors that as your eyes start to shift come around a person. And she said, you mean auras? And I was suddenly shocked. And I said, the kind that Edgar Casey saw? And she said, yes. And then I couldn't see them again. <laughs> <laughs> like, I so wanted to do that, but it sounded too special and unique. So I had to I, like- I, Oh, I, that's what happens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It took, it, it, took, it took years for me to, to re- revisit that um but it was it was a very fun experience and i always you know had this mixed feeling afterwards about edgar casey of awe and uh oh <laughs> it's really that simple uh oh <laughs> yeah and, and he was the most um um what is it, ever average but that's such a negative word but i mean a, a very normal average person he wasn't, yes. he, you know, he 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 shied away from any any sort of uh, adoration or something like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Although he seemed to carry some guilt, if I remember right, that he was like he always felt like he had to help people, and he felt like there was a burden on him. Like these people need my help; they're sick; they're coming to me. I need to give them information and things like exactly. that. Exactly, exactly. He, he he felt a strong calling. That's true. And toward the end of his life, when he was physically ailing, he kept on doing readings like four or five a day, whereas the readings themselves had advised him to only take one or two a day. But he yeah. wouldn't. He, he And so there was a drive in him that, that pushed him, actually. Yeah. In a certain yeah. Way. And, you know, now that we all, all of us here on this call and people listening understand that or most of us had read A Course in Miracles, it sounds like he kind of pressed the pause button on his individual ego self and went right into the mind. Is that the way you interpret what he did? Mm. Uh, what he did was he would go into trance yeah. under the guidance of somebody he trusted, which towards the end of his years was usually his wife or um, uh, Gladys Davis, his secretary. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, And he would actually sort of channel and um uh, the explanation that was that he asked to be given about the process was that he was accessing the akashic records and so he was mm. channeling information from the akashic records so not so much in channeling a person or an entity but he was channeling information and then when he would wake up he wouldn't remember what he he said so that's why um, the secretary had to uh, note everything down and type it up for him. And then he, he'd stay posted on what he had been reading for other people. So that was so, I, I, yeah, I suppose it was a very mindful process in a way, but it's very spiritual too. I mean, he must have had such a clear spiritual calling to be able to, to, to do this for so many years. Yeah, huge volumes of work. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And Lizette, how did you find yes. your way to A Course in Miracles? Was it through uh, Edgar Casey as well, or what was your experience? No, actually, <laughs> through Johanna. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. Tam. I, I, I was just uh, um, hearing uh, Johanna's uh, stories about uh, what she found uh, out to be so special. Uh, 
in uh, the Course in Miracles. And after a few years, because of course, <laughs> I was uh, too stubborn to to think it would be uh, for me uh, a very good thing, because I was then um, um, studying philosophy in uh, and um, in that uh, area. It's uh, it's uh, often very rational thinking. And uh, I thought, well, I, I leave it to, to Johanna. But then uh, gradually I was captivated by her stories. And then I got it as a, I got the book from Johanna as my, as a birthday present. And that's about 20 years ago. And I started doing the lessons every day. And the workbook now is so uh, special and so dear to me. Because I find everything in it that I found in the in various perspectives in philosophy, it's all coming together in the workbook of A Course in Miracles. That's how I feel. Got it. So it was just Joanna who gave me uh, uh, this opportunity, and I'm still grateful for it, Joanna. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> me too. You probably, you probably so didn't realize. What an assignment she was when she hands you that book. You didn't realize what you're getting into. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and then, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, I'm very grateful because um, it, 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 it's uh, uh, there is no day that I do not do the lessons. And um, sometimes uh, uh, it, I, it's about a half an hour, and sometimes it's ten minutes. But every day I look into the. The, the daily lesson and it's given me so much really wonderful yeah well why don't we jump into your forgiveness story lisette would you okay. like to go ahead and share yours yes um, Please. um perhaps um i should start by saying that that we as sisters were um uh were uh, in 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 a family and we were the youngest of four kids and uh at the start of world war ii our parents uh dutch nationals they were uh, both teenagers at the time they were living in the then colony of the netherlands indonesia and uh in, in during that time there was uh, the japanese japanese occupation and they were interned in prison camps on the island of Java. Uh, they survived, uh, and after the war, uh, they came back to the Netherlands. And they met and fell in love. During the time, they sailed back to the Netherlands in a, in a, in a big ship. And that was 1945. Um, and when we, as a family, grew up, our parents didn't tell us much about the horrors of the, the camps. Uh, but uh, on, on the other hand, um, it seemed that uh, both Johanna and I, in our, each in our own way, um, have uh, resonated with the, the, um, the feelings of, of trauma, that were present in our parents, and um, in in fact, we did it each in our own in in our own way because I was uh, struck with feelings of guilt, and uh, this resulted in a deep depression. That um, in my early twenties, I couldn't uh, I couldn't manage uh, my life anymore, and I had a serious uh, depression and I uh, um, was helped by intensive psychotherapy for three years. And after that, um, it seemed to, uh, I, I seemed to have mostly lost uh, of, um, uh, I, I, I mostly was, um, helped by, uh, by the psychotherapy of um, these uh, guilt feelings, but I never understood why I had these 
this depression because our parents were very loving. We had a very loving family. But then at one time, I have uh, had a, a workshop. Uh, a, and in that workshop, there was a, a woman who was telling about her uh, second generation uh, trauma and uh, how she dealt with it. And then, as a matter of fact, I said, well, my parents were in a camp too, but a very different camp, a Japanese camp in Indonesia. And then she she is, she is uh, claimed, she said to me, uh, well, then you're a, a trans, um, transgenerational transfer of trauma uh, patient or a person just uh, as I am. And uh, this uh, made me, um, yeah, this 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 made sense to me at the time because I I said to myself that, that was quite a few years later after the psychotherapy, and then I found out that uh, in the meantime I had found out that the teachings of uh, Sri Nishkadatta Maharaj, the the Indian um, non-duality thinker, and uh, uh, th- that th- that helped me a lot. The the books I am uh, I am that, and um, his conversations with uh, all sorts of people in his home in uh, in Bombay, I found that amazing and inspirational. And um, also um, um, my study of uh, various philosophers like. Plato, for instance. So, uh, but as I, I said earlier, um, it came all together in 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 the Course in Miracles, in the workbook of a Course in Miracles. It seemed that all the threads came together there. Okay. And as far as forgiveness goes, um, I suppose if if, if you yeah. would allow me to add, is that the the sort of like the uh, the transgenerational transfer of trauma, which is like an identified uh, dynamic, uh, which was identified um, having to do with uh, Second World War um, victims of international uh, camps in, uh, you know, G- Germany at the time, mostly Jewish people. Yes. And um, uh, Lisette's uh, psychotherapy work and then helped her release. And then the, the insight of, of that dynamic that was playing in our family uh, sort of uh, formed a catalyst to release even more, to release the thoughts that somebody could be guilty or the release of the thought that there could be a perpetrator at all or the belief of the thought that our parents perhaps should have told us more or do, do more or uh, re- re- repressed less. You know, those types of thoughts could all be released. Did that happen slowly over time or was there kind of a, did it happen in a short period of time where you, this all kind of came together for you? Well, f- for me, it it's kind of my whole life. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I was um, in my 20s when I did the psychotherapy. And um, after that, I uh, the the study of Nisikadatta took about twenty years and started about in my twenties. And then uh, I still study him, but uh, the the study of philosophy took uh, 10, 20 years, and so uh, overlapping times. And then uh, when I um, met, I, I think I was fifty. Uh, when I met uh, the, the woman who, uh, who through her story, uh, helped me find out that uh, what what was the cause of my depression, and this helped a lot because I could, uh, up till then, I was still in 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 sort of I was surprised why should this come up, uh, and I and after that. Um, that was um, uh, more clear that it was um, the um, that I was uh, in fact the, this what I um, you were resonating. Had, you were was resonating, resonating with with my mother's uh, feeling of how can people do these things to each other, 
that was what was resonating in me. How can people do such things to to each other? How can I be a, a member of humanity like that? And in the depression time, I, I said to myself, I do not want to be member of such a humanity. Mm. You understand? Yes. I, I was I was very angry. And 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 um well then when you when you see there are no victims but there are no perpetrators as well that's such a, a, a release a relief so i uh, i think i'm still um, uh, um enjoying the relief of uh understanding that there are no victims that it's not possible to do anything to another um in the sense that uh, another cannot do anything to me. It's the same in the sense that um, we all live uh, our uh, we, we live our own thoughts. And 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 um, when I when, uh, only when I focus on um, uh, anxiety and and and. And, and despair like I did in depression, then y y uh, that's what is um, coming out in the, in, the, in the world around me. Well, <laughs> this doesn't sound all, uh, <laughs> all right, but still I, I feel that, um, that um, there is no victim because, and there is no perpetrator. Both, both are made up in our minds yeah they're misunderstandings yeah. they're, they're misunderstandings yes i'm i'm I, struggling with the english because i'm not oh, used no, to you're doing great you're, you're doing, doing great. you're doing beautifully um i, I just want to say lisette um the word that comes to mind here for how you've been is an empath and yes. it it is yes. um you know picking up the emotions and feelings of others and being born as an empath and, uh, you know, I feel sometimes just, you know, little babies are, are like, you know, ducklings who imprint on whoever they're with, with and think that that might be their mother if, the, if they don't see their mother first. Um, so we <laughs> pick up the stories um, at, that go way, way back gener generationally. Um, and that's why when we talk about healing and time collapsing, particularly through the course, it's like you heal generations in both directions with healing of yourself. So if you have children, you heal their, if you want to call it karma, but um, yes. their path of memory, as well as all that went, all who went before you. Um, and it, it's a hard path to walk, but what's impressive is the point that you've gotten to um, in interest in seeking and in learning um, is a very difficult and challenging point for so many, um, especially direct victims of Holocaust or of crimes um, of hatred of any kind, um, because we're so attached to the victim mentality. We're so attached to what you did out there was so heinous and so egregious and so wrong that if I forgive it, it means that I will forget it. And um, and that's not what we're talking about. And, you know, it it is. So a lot of people don't want to give up their anger because they feel, or many who I've spoken with feel like, uh, that would mean it wasn't okay that that it was okay that it happened yeah. and that they won't remember it if they forgive it. But we're talking in some different language and definitions with the course and going de really deeper. And um, and in a moment, I'd love to share something that, that came on my desktop yesterday. Um, I can share it now or in a moment, I'd have to find it for a second <laughs> but um but oh here it is okay it was yesterday was yom kippur which for um the jewish tradition um it's the holiest day of the jewish year and um this is what came and i want to share this because it really is it goes with this it's um 
This is the time when we ask forgiveness from those we've hurt and offer forgiveness to those who may have hurt us. Um, I can't tell you what rabbi gave this as a speech. It just came to me. Um, he says, or she, um, to forgive is not to forget. To forgive is really to remember that nobody is perfect, that each of us stumbles when we want so much to stay upright, that each of us say th says things we wish we had never said, that we can all forget that love is more important than being right. To forgive is really to remember that we are so much more than our mistakes, that we are often more kind and caring, that accepting others' flaws can help us accept our own. To forgive is to remember that the odds are pretty good that we might soon need to be forgiven ourselves, that life sometimes gives us more than we can handle gracefully. To forgive is to remember that we have room in our hearts to begin again and again and again. May we all be inscribed for the coming year with health, happiness, contentment, and peace. And this moved me so much because there is forgiveness as the Course says it, which is this never even happened. We're in a dream. And yet in this dream, we're in a level of form. And how do we weave that forgiveness um, where it's palatable to us to forgive? Um, through what we do and through what others do to us. And this this touched me very much. So I, I hope it's okay that I shared it. No, yeah, it thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Lovely. Yeah. And still, I, I would like to add, Tam, that as you say, A Course in Miracles is going much further by yeah. saying that forgiveness recognizes what you thought your brother did to you has not occurred. And this has puzzled me so much because I said, uh, uh, that's the, the, the big dilemma. Um, how can I say it, it didn't occur to me, the depression? Yeah. And, and then you, you, you come to realize that the whole, the whole setting is, is, um, is occupied by hum human beings who are in one way or another, doing what they think is best. And this is what in philosophy is also said uh, by, uh, for instance, Plato, who says uh, you can be wrong because you're not educated enough, not sophisticated enough, and or doesn't if you if you if you when you have no experience, but you're always doing what you think is the best in a particular situation. And I, uh, this helped me a lot because then I saw that a perpetrator is someone who is uh, misunderstanding what is good in that situation. Am I, uh, I don't yes. know if this is... If this is um, I It is coming through. It is coming through. <laughs> and I think, um, I think it, you know, there's so many different ways to approach this and whatever brings us individually peace within that is what's important in all of this because people come to the ways to release this, um, this frustration, anxiety. How do we, how do we move through what happened? Um, yeah. and so. Yeah. As I say, your answer is wonderful. There's also, you know, if you if you look at it in another way, you know, the Course says we don't know what anything is for. It is yeah. such a powerful statement. We don't know what anything is for. So, great, I mean, great. There, yeah. We either believe or we don't believe that there's a higher intelligence within us that that and collectively um, called love that actually does know what everything is for and there are reasons for things that we see that are, are horrendous that culturally and nationally and internationally may have different meaning in years to come to produce different things but i you know even with philosophy um it, i find it very funny because not just philosophy but from copernicus and plato and and all of that the science of what is what they still, and we still just know what we know now. And then we're always claiming, look, science just found this is how it is. 
But yeah. then we find out a little later, ah, yeah, a little bit more Different. than that. <laughs> and if you look back yeah. on each person and what they knew, it was it was even more than what they thought was best. It was I figured it out now. <laughs> when we do to remember the lesson, eh, maybe not, because in the future, this may be just another little piece of something much yeah. bigger. Like the world is flat. No, the world is round. Actually, the world is even more than that. Um, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. so, yeah. but I will address that I find the easiest way to explain to people that this did not happen is to imagine that most people know what it's like to dream at night. And when you can dream at night and you can be full of depression, anxiety, fear, um, love, any anything. Uh, and when you wake up, you know that that was just a dream. So a, a million things can happen in this dream that we're in. When we wake up, the thread that we've been given is... Um, we are love and this is all a dream. So it didn't really happen. And that's what the didn't really happen. The best that I can equate it personally mm -hmm. of, Oh well, yeah, I just dreamt that it didn't really happen. And that person is actually, or, you know, sitting next to me. If I still give it a form when I wake up, you know, um, Oh, you didn't do that to me last night, but I'm, <laughs> I, I may still even be angry with you this morning. after. <laughs> <laughs> And and that's yeah. the best that I can equate it thus yeah. far. Yeah, I I think you're you you're right to say that there are so many different uh, paths to the same truth, and um, it's what you resonate with. And uh, for me, uh, it was very important to have an answer to the, the what resonates resonated in me because of the question my mother held for herself. Um, and that was the question of why do people do atrocious things to each other? And why, why, why is that? And the answer is um, it's, it's um, not knowing what, what you do when you do these things. Not not understanding. It's ignorance, and it's a misunderstanding, and it's not uh, evil. <laughs> it seems to be that that's where the line of Jesus comes through. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. Yes, yes. and yes. that's where that understanding comes. And in the course, it's like you don't have to because they never really even did do it. Yes, you know, yes. It's how deep? How deep you go? this belief but but in this world of form i find that it's important as well to to release from that question where you can find your own answer to to then go through to the next step of level of understanding and if you can't and if people out there say i can't get past that there's always one trick that can often help and <laughs> it's ask for help you may not oh. be able to do it yourself. You may not be able to. No. And when you release and say, I put it in your hands, help me, help me to find that solution for myself or that forgiveness so I can move on. Uh, angels swoop in or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. No, your yes. own self, your, your deeper self, inner self, higher yes. self comes sure. in. Sure. <laughs> I think... Um, sure. We, uh, uh, Johanna, we had uh, a grandfather who was uh, reverent in in the Marine, also in the war. He was in 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 uh, the Navy, yeah. In the Navy, yeah. And um, he uh, made us uh, feel. He made me feel that I could always ask anything uh, in in prayer, and uh, so I I did that my whole life and I think that that made it possible to go from depression to being one of the happiest people in the world I know yeah the happiest <laughs> people. one of the happiest people you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> that <true>. love that <laughs> <laughs> and, and Johanna what 
what's been your reaction to Lizette's transformation and her own sharing of this with you? And what was your mother's? What was your take on your mother? Did you have a similar path? Um, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, when Lizette was going through her depression, I was incredulous. I just I had no idea what was going on with her. So there was like a period that we weren't so close because I just couldn't understand what what what, what she was going through. And fortunately, there were many other people in our family who who did hold her hand literally, and so she she pulled through. Um, but we've, you know, we, we were only 13 months apart. So we almost grew up as, as twins. And so the, those bonds never break. And um, when my, my family and I moved to the California, Liette and I kept in close contact through airmail letters. At the time, there, there was no internet. So we had to wait for letters to arrive in the mail because I was in California and she was in the Netherlands. And it would like t- take like 10 days for a letter to get to me and then 10 days for a letter of mine to get to her. So you can imagine how we would look forward to the mail coming. Anyway, uh, so we stayed really close. Okay. And uh, she was the one actually who put me on the spiritual path by by um, telling me about what she was reading, all the philosophy that she was reading. Um, anyway, um, uh, and so by the time I moved back, back to Europe, we were both very much we both had a very inquiring mind and I had been involved in the, in the, in the course in miracles and et cetera, et cetera. And then um, uh, when she told me about this um, Jewish lady that she had met at the workshop who had told her about the transgenerational transfer of trauma, that suddenly left me flabbergasted because I felt something is going on here that I need to know. So we both delved into that subject. We read up, we read up about it. And then Lisette at some point said, well, I don't think you resonated with with mom's um, unresolved issue, but with dad's. And together we discovered, uh, I think, using Byron Katie's method too. I mean, that that played a big role in in our process. And we discovered that um, our dad, who was a young young teenager at the time, he was imprisoned in the the war camp. at some point, he felt that the liberation wasn't going to come. And that was his big fear, that they would just all die in the camp and nobody would know about it. And so he fought this futility thought, like in anything that you can do, it's, you know, it's no use. It's no use. Just forget about it. No use. He was fighting that thought all through those three years of imprisonment. And he kept that with him. He was a fighter. I, I don't know him any different than being a fighter. Yeah. Yes. Because he was battling the thought that it's all futile. And that was the feeling that that sort of resonated with me. And I I came up with this thought of, you know, it's no use trying, you know, it's, it's no use. It's futile. Don't don't worry, just you know, just let it all be. And that felt so foreign to me because I'm I'm naturally a happy person. And then this thought would just wash over me and I would just sit on the couch and couldn't move a leg. And uh, Lisette and I talked about it. And when I discovered, oh, darn, this is my dad's unresolved issue that I'm resonating with and that I'm making real in my life every day, that I allow these thoughts to to just uh, come and and, uh, dominate my mind, that's when I found the power the power or the or the reason or the motivation to say I, I'm not having any of this. It's you know, I, I feel for my dad and and I I you know I love him deeply. At that time he was still alive. Uh, I love him deeply, but this is not my issue and I'm not having any of these futile thoughts anymore. And that was actually quite a short process. Mm. And occasionally I would still have these futile thoughts and and I don't know any other words. There's probably a, a ton of other words to say it, but <laughs> a few times it uh, pops up right now. Um, well, it seems like what happens um, is, you know, we start to develop the witness. And yes, you know, when we see, oh my gosh, this was my father's, my brother's, my dog's. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, that I've, that I've imprinted and taken on for myself. 
you you can start to see what the witness is in your own self with your own ego. Oh, this is my own ego's thought about this. This isn't even mine. You know, it's not only, you know, my father's or someone else's. Now that's not even my thought because I am love. Yeah. And it, it has a pathway deeper and deeper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And and um that ties in with 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 the course's teaching that the world you see, the world you experience, the quality of the world you experience reflects the quality of of your thinking and of your feeling. And so as long as I do not decide against these feelings of futility, they will be the ones that are going to shape my environment, what I see, what I experience. And um, and so that's really my my mm, my motivation to release, to let go, what the Course calls forgiveness. Because what I experience and what I see is purely a reflection of what's going on in my mind. And if I don't like or if I get upset, it is a call to go into my mind and ask for help to release whatever it is that I'm believing that's not in line with love. So that's the the thing that liberates us from being a victim. Exactly. Yeah. And that's very powerful. It is very powerful. And I've actually seen Johanna put it to complete use with, with life and death and how, you know, and I won't go into your your story, but but you know, kind of watching how you moved through things that other people could not move through or make sense of with not even trying to make sense of it, but going to the love and offering love and being love has um has been impactful. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You mean the death in my family recently? I do. Yeah. I do. Uh, my granddaughter died as a baby. So, you know, for other people, you know, they might be wondering, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's that's that yeah. and I, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, she was only a week old and she and she passed away. Um, I don't have an answer for that. And 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 even the thought that it's something in the world out there, because it's out there, and so it reflects something in my mind, even I can't I can't wrap my head around it. So I'm not trying to. I'm just mm-hmm. loving loving my son and his wife. I'm loving the baby that left. Or that's still around, but it's not in, in bodily form anymore. I'm and I, I want to see love in everything. I just want to see the light in everything. And that's yeah. pulling me and the parents too through. Yeah, I think I, I really do feel like the acceptance to that I do not know what anything is for. It yeah. it's such um it's almost like a, a shortcut. You yeah, know, exactly. Pain and suffering. <laughs> Uh, because we are so drawn to figure out why, what did I do? What, what happened in the world? What were the causes and effects and consequences and, and, you know, on and on. And science will prove certain things and our mind will prove other things and psychology will prove other things. But if we really don't know what anything is for, um, there's one part of it that just makes it okay to move through it. Not okay that it happened necessarily, but okay to stop haunting ourselves with a lot of mind thoughts instead of moving through and reconnecting with that loving state that I saw you do so beautifully. Mm, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's 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 the love that in the tiny instant when the tiny mad idea happened was inserted right then and there for us to hold on to. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love how the two of you, as you say, um, being born so close in time together just um seem to be moving through this path uh, as kind of spiritual twins and mighty companions for each other absolutely yes, yes yeah. absolutely yes yeah. we only need a glance we don't even need words to understand what the other is going through oh. or saying or <laughs> yeah yeah it's really a, a, a gift yes
And, and yeah, the funny thing is that my, my mom used to, set, to tell us, jokingly actually, but she said like, uh, because people would ask her, you know, why four, why not three kids or why not five or, you know, whatever. And then she would, she would answer, well, you know, um, Lisette was born like three years after her, her sibling before her. And she thought that was a bit of a big distance. So she said, we needed a playmate for Lisette. So we just needed somebody to, you know, to, to make her a pair. <laughs> that's, that's so ridiculous. Yolanda, I, mean, I just love that thought. I just love it. I feel very embarrassed about it. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm always intrigued with um with actual twins like my favorite is when one twin is born new year's eve and the other is born a few hours later so they're in a whole different <laughs> year but they're twins um but but no what impresses me with this is is just the path that lisette had the depression through her empathy and johanna you couldn't connect to it like what's what's the deal and johanna you were then going on this your own spiritual path and um were able to give it to lisette who then gave you back your own awareness of how you were um em empathic to your dad mm -hmm. or empathetic mm -hmm. um to your dad and so like it's like you you keep reflecting the other side of the coin that's the same coin to each other. And it's, mm -hmm. it's very beautiful. Well put. Yeah. It's very yeah. nicely put. Yeah. That's how it feels. That's how it feels. We're very connected, very connected. Yeah. And yes. yeah. with your parents, did they experience, um, like you said, they repressed these memories mostly. Did it start to come up for them at all as, as you forgave it or did that not happen for them? Um, I think Lisette at one point tried to talk to them about it, but they sort of kept their distance. It was, I, I, I the re, the way yes. I look at it is it's that they didn't feel it was for them to tackle this lifetime. Mm. You know, it was yeah, something that, that <laughs> yeah, exactly. They went through enough. On the other but, hand, when we did the, the, uh, when we uh, had contact through the medium, Johanna, with our parents, they thanked us for our work for the whole family true mm -hmm. and so i'm 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 convinced that what you said tam about doing this kind of work uh, this really release, release work you, you do it for your children but you do it for your parents and grandparents yeah, yeah. In, in two ways i'm i'm convinced about that yes because and too, even if even if there's no such thing um as as spirits who still remain in personality there's still an no. energetic that we carry in completion and cellularly you know that that it's time to release and um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's it matters my my first cousin does a lot of work with um secrets hidden in genealogy and when you and, mm. and there he takes movies and shows the symbolism of oh there was a hidden secret there and what unfolds and what keeps getting reenacted uh genera mm. generationally because of that but mm -hmm. but i want to know how your other siblings um take to you both practicing a course in miracles are are they interested or do they not care what it, what is the rest of the family response to you both mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if it's our place to to fill that in for them. Um, they're not into the course. Mm -hmm. They're not into. They're, they're, they have found their paths, and they both seem. Our eldest sister is very happy, and our, our we have one brother, and he's. I think he's 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 happy too, uh, but he's not. They're not interested in the in the course so much. Yeah. Now. Either way. No. Yeah. And we talk to but, them but about, about the difference. The... Do they Sorry? see a difference in you both? Do they acknowledge or see a difference in you both? Not that it matters. I'm just curious. Yeah. I they, think love, they, they, love, they love us to bits. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you need to know? That's the only answer that's just worth anything to tell you the truth. <laughs> and we love them too. We love them yeah, too. Absolutely. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The differences don't matter. They really yeah. do not matter at all. No. Yeah. Always well, good to know that not everyone needs to do the course. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. I don't know exactly. if you can hear that. I, I apologize. I have a siren in the background. Not sure if you can hear that, but I apologize. No. I can. Okay. Nope. Well, 
we'd like to keep this really practical. Um, Johanna, when you get caught in what I call an ego storm and just get dragged into it, like in times like this, we're talking and we're all really can see, see things pretty clearly. It feels good. But every once in a while, we just step in a bear trap and get taken down. When that happens, what do you do to kind of recenter yourself and bring yourself into forgiveness? Mm. Um, one of the things that come to mind is um, the hush of heaven holds my heart today, which is one of the lessons. And I just love the alliteration. So I, I say that to myself. But when I'm in a real storm, I go like, yeah, humbug. I mean, I, I don't, I, w- I won't have it. So then I go do the dishes. I go do the dishes or the laundry, something to keep me busy and focused on something else. And yeah. And trying to bite my tongue because I know if I start talking, I'll, I'll just say things that make it worse. <laughs> so you just accept it and let it pass and do something constructive. It sounds like. Um, it's it's not like passing in the sense that I forget about it, but it's just that I know that if I respond from at that moment in in the mood that I'm in, in the storm that I'm in, I'm only going to make it worse. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so I need to step back and uh, allow the storm to subside a bit and, and take stock. And the hush of heaven holds my heart today is just such a lovely, oh, lovely phrase to remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel. Like I, I, I don't have a foolproof method, Matt. I don't. Sometimes okay. this works. Some sometimes something else works. Yeah, it's almost like when we get triggered, it's almost like we become a gun with a trigger ourselves, <laughs> part of the trigger. And if we, by our tongue or our actions, do anything within being that gun, we're just going to be shooting more. Uh, bullets out <laughs> and yep, yep. So hold it and slow it down and let the bullet drop on the floor you know pick exactly, it up with, the exactly. with a little bit of a time yeah. it's not like it goes away it's just it's you can handle it differently exactly and and the, the realization that it's a reflection of something in me it is yeah. not a cause out there the cause is never out there yep. What I yeah. see is always a reflection of something in me. And so it's in me that I have to tackle it and not yeah. out there. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you, Lizette? Yeah, Lizette, we got to hear from you now. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, uh, maybe slightly different, but also the same. Uh, when I am caught in an ego storm, as you put it, then um, and I realize I'm not feeling good. I'm not happy anymore. Uh, When I realize that, then uh, I say to myself, this is a misunderstanding. As a son of God, we are all uh, 100% happy. So this is a misunderstanding. And where is the misunderstanding? And I'm more like... um, Thinking about what in the situation uh, is uh, a reflection of my feelings and how can I relate to that? And um, I, I can say, um, like Johanna is, is doing, she's uh, easier in just letting go. And for me, it's always a thinking process as well. But as the A Course in Miracles is a thought uh, system, that's what speaks to me. There, there is sort of, uh, for me, logical answer to every question and also to an ego storm. When I know that I'm just caught in a misunderstanding, then, well, then, it's, then I can let it go because I say to myself, I, I not, uh, at this moment, I do not know what misunderstanding I'm caught in, and uh, but I believe it's the case because I experience this so often that when I ask, uh, "What is this for?" in 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 sort of prayer or meditation, then uh, the answer will will come. Sometimes the answer will comes very quickly, and I understand what my misunderstanding is, and that that's often funny and sometimes it comes <laughs> after a few days 
hilarious <laughs> yeah hilarious really yes yes because it it it's uh, what you said them i do not know what anything is for it's such a powerful uh, understanding yes so that's my uh, way of uh, going through an ego storm but the first thing is to understand it's not uh, okay it's it, it because you can be angry and just go on being angry not noticing that you're angry is 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 this making sense to you oh absolutely absolutely that that's the most difficult when we don't know it and then it comes to our attention and i always yeah. say that the joke is always on us like the moment you reconnect <laughs> with spirit it's like oh yeah haha funny <laughs> yeah. Yeah. sure and sure it absolutely. is good to have people to laugh with you about your own what i'd call bad behavior sometimes <laughs> um, yeah 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 but yeah yeah, yeah, but sure. that, that is it. You know, when I eat garlic, I get um, very aggressive and very <laughs> cranky. And I and garlic is in so much and I really try and avoid it. And when I have to eat it because of I love it so much or because um, <laughs> someone's put it in something and I don't want to be rude, then I'm aware of my aggressive behavior and I can modify it because I'm aware mm -hmm. of it. Is but it raw I or cooked? It, Both. Oh, well, <laughs> raw and I can't even touch it goes right in me but but when I eat it and I don't know that I've eaten it it's mm. very difficult and, and my son will always say mom did you have garlic and something and I'll stop and go oh <laughs> that. okay and it's it's fun to be able to blame something for your bad behavior <laughs> but, um, but that's how I do know the difference very clearly of when I don't know something and I'm reacting in a way that I rather not or doesn't mm -hmm. feel in alignment so mm -hmm. yes i do i in other words yes i understand <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 the the roman soldiers used to put raw um raw garlic on the tips of their spears because it had such a terrible effect when stabbed into the human body when it was raw oh, uh, yeah. I, that's really, why i only I cook garlic going. Yeah. No, no. The, the, if if it gets in it like a, through a wound, it's bad. Like some people take it when they have a cold on honey. I've I've heard that. But it does seem to have uh, some sort of effect, maybe uh, different people in different ways, but it's definitely a powerful agent of some kind. It is. I always felt kind of a little mixed when I heard, but but really glad to hear that like the Hare Krishnas don't put garlic in anything. And a lot of Indian... Um, traditions cultures um don't literally don't put garlic in because they feel it activates the mind too much mm -hmm. um, and then yeah. many you know use it unbelievably but it's... i don't know anything i just know i'm like a vampire and garlic makes me <laughs> 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 yeah but which brings us to our speaking of garlic which, yeah i hope it's not anybody's I comfort thought... food <laughs> yeah, I, it is my. I I used to eat raw garlic sandwiches, so oh I'm very God. sad about my not being. Damn, you able might be to an eat alien it. eating raw garlic sandwiches. <laughs> I, I love. <laughs> it was my favorite favorite food. No, when I when we moved to France and I was four years old, everybody, uh, my whole family thought I was the pickiest eater in the world because I hated like tuna fish sandwiches and milk and macaroni and cheese and um, all the things that that we certainly in the early 1960s gave children to eat and um, just didn't like anything. And then we moved to France and my mother was so concerned, oh my God, how are we going to feed this child? And I tasted garlic and my favorite food was um, escargot snails and frog's legs. Uh, <laughs> you know, at, and at age five, that's what I wanted for my birthday dinner. So I yeah. loved garlic. Then it, you know, something switched to my chemistry. I probably had too much, but. <laughs> yeah, but. which does bring us to go ahead, Matt. Yes, we like to know what your favorite comfort food is. is Stroop waffle. Some you've got some good ones in another list. <laughs> Stroop waffle. Stroop yeah. waffle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Well, are, cookie, what, cookies come close. Yeah. Cookies come close. Well, tell us your. <laughs> give us some specifics, Lizette. Why don't you go first? Oh, I um. <laughs> I have no answer at the moment. What's my favorite comfort food? 
I think I don't have comfort food. Really. Oh, maybe maybe when you go to the do you go to the Christmas market there in uh, the Netherlands? Oh, perhaps it's it's like it's dropjes, drop. Yes, drop. You know, drop. <laughs> Liquor, licorice, licorice, licorice. Yeah, red or black. I, I really red. like liquors. Red much. or black. Yeah. Black. Black. Yeah, okay. black. black. Yeah. You're a diehard. <laughs> yeah. That's good for yeah. digestion, right? Yeah, it is. It is. Love that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's that's perhaps what I most like as a, as a, as a favorite comfort food. Yes. Mm. Oh, good. And how <laughs> and how about you, Joanna? I think cookies come close, and peanuts, cookie, and something that you can chew on, that you can just use your muscles and and uh, crunch. <laughs> Yeah, that, that you, helps. Crunchy. You know Snickerdoodles? Have you heard of Snickerdoodles, Johanna? Snickerdoodles? Have you heard of Snickers? Um, they're they're a, a peanut butter chip cookie. And the peanut oh. butter is in the cookie. And mm. it's really good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tam, Tam, Tam what's, what's yours besides garlic sandwich? You can't leave us with that. Do you, do you actually have a comfort <laughs> food? I, want I to know do. Now. I mean, I have several comfort foods. So um, depending upon what I'm disturbed by that I go to, <laughs> and mashed potatoes is like an all time comfort food. But oh, also mm. there's something called nut, nut roll that my mother used to oh, make for me right. at, I've, on every yeah. birthday. And that has like coffee, whipped cream and, and apricot jam in it that I just adore. Um, and, you know, they're but garlic really was, and it, oh, I'm sorry, anything with heavy cream in it, anything. Like it doesn't <laughs> have to be whipped cream. I used to drink as a child. This is yeah, you could see why I had some gastric intestinal issues. Um, I used to drink cups that didn't like milk, but I would drink heavy cream with sugar, powdered oh boy, sugar. That is good. That Loved is good. it. Yeah. yeah, really comforting until my stomach didn't think so. Oh, I, I think every meal is comforting because I enjoy eating. Yeah. yeah. Always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and the company you have while eating is comfort yes. too. Yes. That's totally That's true. true. And then you add hot chocolate in with whipped cream and boy, is that comforting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well Johanna, Lisette, Thanks so much for coming on Miracle Voices and sharing your Miracle Voice. We really appreciate it. I feel like I learned a lot today. And it was it, this was like a comfort food for me, just hearing you talk about this and your whole process and how you went through it all. And I'm sure it was for the listeners, too. So thanks so much for coming on. Thank thanks you for having really us. Wonderful forgiveness stories. Really brought up a lot. Um, so thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Nothing else.